today we're going to finish our study in 2 Samuel um, 23 and 24. And this whole series, we've been watching David grow. We watched him grow from a young man all the way up into a king. And throughout this entire story, there's been successes and there have been failures. And through these successes and failures, we see that David is setting the stage for a greater king that is gonna come. That was one of the core goals of the author of this book. The author wanted to record David's life so that people knew David's life and David's life could be an example to the people, but also to cultivate an expectation inside of the people for a, a better coming king. And so I pray that as we studied through this, those two things, the writer's intent have uh, laid an impression on us, that as we read through David's life, there are lots of examples that he's giving us, positive and negative, things that we should implement as examples to follow and things that we should steer clear of. But also, I pray that it stirs inside of us an expectation for a better king than any earthly king that has ever lived, okay? That's the goal of this. When you read 2 Samuel, I want you to see David, but I also want you to see Jesus. And so as we close today in 2 Samuel 23 and 24, I want the same thing. I want you to be looking at this text with the lenses of Christ so that you see him at work and so you see God's entire story. Okay, we're, we're not just reading 2 Samuel because it's a history book and you need to know what happened. We're reading it because when Jesus walked the earth, the scriptures he taught from, it was this stuff. This is what Jesus taught from. When the apostles are writing the New Testament and they're writing letters, what they reference is this material. So we need to know this material. But as we interpret and, and understand this material, there has been an event in history that changes how we read this stuff, and that is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we read this, we see that David wasn't just a character in history, he was a shadow of a greater coming king. That's how we read scripture, amen? So I pray that those have been impressed upon you. But as we close today, the author, I feel like, is inviting us to consider one final thing, to reflect on one final thing. And I think that this final thing is a summary of the book. I think if you had to put a subtitle on First and Second Samuel, I think a good subtitle would be a study in leadership. Okay, there's a lot of references about shepherding and about what it looks like to be a good king and a bad king and what leadership should look like in the local church, in the home, and in the world that God has created. And so as we read these last two chapters, I, I see the author inviting us to reflect on two main things. First, the blessing of leadership. What does it mean to have good, godly leadership among God's people? And what impact does good godly leadership among God's people impact God's people to be a witness in a broken and fallen and lost world? Okay, so the first thing I think the author wants us to consider is the impact of leadership, good godly leadership. And he'll give us a contrast of not just godly leadership, but also worthless, wicked leadership. So it's those two things together, but primarily godly leadership. So that's the thing we're honing in on, but there's another component to us because we as human beings have this tendency to not just be okay with um, having a model or uh, uh, someone that we can follow as they follow Christ. We always have this temptation to go a little bit farther and to turn that person that we look to into an idol. It, there, there's this fascination in human beings to romanticize leaders and leadership and to idolize leaders and leadership. And so those are the two things that I think the author is getting us to consider. Because in 23, we're gonna see David's impact and a reflection from his own words of what it means for godly leadership to be present among God's people. And then the very next chapter is an example of David failing again, right? So why do we have those two things setting together? I think it's because the author wants you to never forget that there is a place among God's people for godly leaders, but that place is not godly leader worship. Okay? You should aspire to be an example 
but you should not aspire to be worshiped, and the people need to be careful of the two, because if you're not careful, then bad things happen. So that's where I wanna get into today. So if you go to your Bibles, we're gonna go to 2 Samuel 23, and we're gonna start, uh, let's go read verses one through seven. <clears throat> it says, now these are the, the last words of David. Now, it's the last words of David in this book. As we get into Kings, David will be saying other things. But it's the last words of David at the end of this book. The oracle of David, the son of Jesse. The oracle of the man who was raised on high. The anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. This is what David says from his own words. The spirit of the Lord speaks by me and his word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. And David reflects, for does not my house stand so with God? This is what godly leadership looks like, and David looks around saying, I've been trying to embody this my whole life, because he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? And here comes the one-two punch, but worthless men are like thorns that are thrown away for they cannot even be taken with the hand. But the man who touches them arms himself with iron and the shaft of a spear, and they are utterly consumed with fire. Let's pause there. So after all of the success and failure in David's life, David is reflecting, and the author wants you to hear his reflection in his own voice. So after all of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, after all of the stories, him protecting the sheep, him wandering in the wilderness, him running from Saul, him running from his own son, his mistakes with Bathsheba, in his final reflective words, what has David learned? These are the two things David has learned. One, that a godly leader who fears the Lord is like the sun on a clear sky morning. A godly leader among God's people who is keeping their eyes focused on the Lord is like the sun that rises in the morning and it sheds light on everything and it illuminates things that were confusing or dark in the past. It's like rain that falls on the grass and produces life. It's the sun that beats on your face early in the morning when you're down at the beach on vacation and it rises up and it's casting this beautiful hue across the ocean. And that sun hits your face and you know that evening is done and the darkness is no longer raining because the light is here. David's reflection on godly leadership is that is what it's like for God's people when the people who are in charge do what they're supposed to do. It's like a sunrise. And the contrast to that is that people who are worthless leaders are like thorns that nobody wants to touch. I've got these blackberry, these wild blackberry bushes that grow in my backyard, maybe some of you, same region, so you know what I'm talking about. And they just kind of get everywhere. And they get up and they wind around stuff and they consume stuff. And you can't just go grab them and pull them out. And even if you grab gloves and you go and pull them out, these tiny little hair-like thorns, they just find their way into your skin. Three days later, you're like, what is that? Oh, that's from the other day when I was gardening. David says that worthless leaders, wicked leaders, leaders who are in it for themselves, who want to take advantage of the sheep, they are like thorns that no one wants to touch, no one wants to go near. And if you do touch them, you guard yourself up with iron or you try to touch it with a spear. This picture is, is, is so valuable. Because he's talking about two different kinds of leader. One kind of leader, you are fully 
Embra- like when, when this leader is doing what God has told him to do, it's, it's like a sunshine. And this leader over here, you don't even want to go near this leader. You're walking on eggshells every time they say something. You're afraid you're going to say the wrong thing. So you don't even want to touch. You don't want to go close. These are the two contrasts of what David has learned. And as we've seen in 1st, 2nd, and 2nd Samuel, for, excuse me, 1st Samuel and 2nd Samuel, is that David has been both of these leaders. There was a time when he was fully fixed on the Lord and his only desire was to shepherd God's people the way God called them to. And when that was happening, things were good in Israel. God was blessing Israel. His people were blessed when he was doing the right thing. But when he started modeling sin and disobedience and rebellion, and functioning as a worthless, selfish leader. When he did this, Israel suffered and nobody wanted anything to do with him. They ran him out of town. Things that were, people that were his friends, that were the closest to him, as soon as this stuff started happening, as soon as he started acting wickedly, even his closest friends are turning their back on him. So as we read through this, what is our understanding? What is the author? What is the Spirit of God who is the ultimate author of this text trying to get us to understand? In the same way that David is reflecting on leadership, the Spirit of God wants you today to reflect on leadership. I wrote down a couple questions to kind of stir that to you, but I don't want you to be anchored to just these questions. I want these to start other questions inside of you because the purpose of this section is for you to read it, see David reflecting on leadership, and then for you to say, I need to reflect on leadership. Because I need to look for good leadership and, start, and stop falling for garbage leadership. If I look back on my life, I, if I'm honest with myself, I am a sucker for somebody who is charismatic but has no character. Man, as soon as they start talking, where are we going? I'm here. It happens every time and there's always failure that comes with it. So I need to reflect on what I'm looking for in strong leadership, but I also need to reflect on the kind of leader that I am because there's people watching me, whether I, whether I know it or not, I'm, I'm running things, I'm in charge of things, and I need to be the kind of leader that, that is like a sunrise and not a bunch of dried out thorns. So here's a couple questions. When you're reflecting on your choices in your daily life, do you cultivate an atmosphere of healthy leadership around you? Just by the choices that you make, and I'm talking every single level, I'm talking if you're involved in government, if you're involved in the marketplace, if you are running a home, if you have a family, if you are serving in a church, if if you are a single person and you have some form of leadership at your job, ask yourself, in reflection on what David is reflecting, ask yourself this question, what kind of atmosphere am I cultivating with the leadership styles that I am choosing? Am I combative? And if I'm honest, Does it seem like no one wants to come near me? And when they do, they're all geared up on a suit of armor? Or does it seem like when I show up and I start speaking to my people, the the, the ones who are following me, like they seem refreshed. That's what I want. I wanna be a refreshing sunrise to them. Here's another one. Reflect on how godly shepherding brings out the best in people. See, we're in our world, especially in the marketplace, so focused on getting the most productivity out of people that we will choose systems over people. And what that means is, is that in a particular business, there are certain decisions that you will make that will, that will maximize profits or maximize efficiency, but will actually cast people to be just thrown into the cogs of the machine. And pretty soon, you find that your leadership style is one who will just sacrifice people, and this human bloodshed is the thing that runs the machine. Unfortunately, there are many churches in America that run off of the sacrificial blood of people being tossed into the machine. This is in the marketplace, in the world, and it also has infiltrated the church. Because we don't choose When we're asking these questions, we don't choose what decision is going to bring the best out of the people, that is gonna cultivate the most fruit. 
We're asking questions that what is the most expedient? What is the most affordable? Sometimes you need to take those conversations off the table and just deal with what produces the most fruit in the person and not what produces the most money. If churches would start focusing on discipling people and stop focusing in so much on trying to fill a room, I think many of our churches would be in a much healthier place. Here's another question. Can you reflect on how you were blessed when a godly leader modeled righteousness for you? A godly leader raises the watermark for everybody in the room. So how can you make decisions that raise the high watermark for everybody in the room? And in what ways, when you're doing that, can you look back on people in your life who have had, that made that impact on you, can start forming the opinion of the way that you should act today? As you start looking back on your walk of faith or your journey as you grow in a leader, what influences have you had? Have you spent an an enormous amount of time listening to what secular people on some podcasts have to say about things uh, in regards to leadership when you've got an entire like text of God's word teaching you what leadership looks like? Look, I don't know any other way to say this. Garbage belongs in the garbage, okay? And you, as God's people, have got to get better at discerning what is garbage and what is pearls. Okay? God does hide pearls out there in the field, but he's got a book full of pearls. And if we would spend less time asking what a non-believer who does not even believe God exists, what they think about a specific matter, and we spent more time coming before the God of the universe who created everything and asking him what he thinks about the matter, I think we might be in a better situation. Now we say that and we amen because that sounds like a no-brainer when you say it like that. But then on Monday morning when you pop into your car and you open up the podcast app, like let's see what the world is saying about things. And then all of a sudden, you've got a warped view of war going on in Israel, and you've got all these bizarre opinions about uh, education and government and and celebrity and the people that you're listening to. And all of a sudden, this, this person who is particularly good at writing music, and their music just sounds really good, now all of a sudden you heard their opinion on some social media site about something, and now because they're, an, they're a subject matter expert on music, you think they're a subject matter expert on sexuality. Or this person who's a mommy blogger, or this guy who runs this, this YouTube video, and he seems really eloquent and really put together, and he started, he's, he's an expert on this one area, and all of a sudden, one of the, one of the videos, he kind of turns and he offers you his opinion on this other thing. And because you think highly of this person as a leader, you start taking what they're saying, and, and it, it seeps subtly on the inside of you. This is the kind of thing that, that, that God is having David reflect on, and I think that it needs to be a reflection for us. Because you have to consider how your impact right now is having on other leaders around you. Because if you're not careful, you're gonna reproduce something, and you might just end up re- reproducing more of yourself and not more of Christ. Now the end of this, the end of this uh, five, six, seven, there's this contrast. There is all of this encouragement. Man, a good godly leader is awesome. You want one in the midst of God's people, but there's also this warning. There's this warning about um, if you aren't aspiring to godly leadership, then you're gonna end up being a worthless leader. And the text doesn't offer a middle ground. That's important. There's no middle ground here. There's godly leaders who follow God's ways, and then there's everybody else. We convince ourselves that there's a third way, but there isn't a third way, there's two ways. There is fixing your eyes on Christ and doing things the way that the creator of the universe has established things, and then there's everything else. Jesus sums it up this way in John 8, 42, where he talks about you're either, you're either doing things uh, because your father is from above or you're doing things because your father is from below. You're, you've got, your father is the father of lies. I mean, that's pretty cut and dry. 
There's two ways to lead. There's Christ's way and there's everybody else's way. And unfortunately, everybody else's way is under the sway of a completely different kingdom. And you can't cherry pick from that other kingdom in order to inform the things of this kingdom. So the contrast is there. So after exposing this worthless leader, we, the author brings us back to some of the impacts of the godly leader and we go through this section of David's mighty men. So as we're going through this, I don't want you to forget, like what we're focusing on here is the beauty of godly leadership among God's people. What does it do? How does it impact God's people? And in what way should you be considering leading in a godly way? Okay, now let's get into verse eight. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Josheb, Bashabeth, of Tachmanite. He was chief of the three. He wheeled his spear against 800 whom he killed at one time. All right, now, let's just pause and calmly reflect on that for a moment. <laughs> Those are some pretty impressive odds. One verse 800. And this guy didn't have modern technology, he didn't have a gun. This guy, he killed 800 men with a spear. It doesn't stop there. We're gonna go through a long series of men who displayed great courage because they served under a leader who modeled great courage. Do you remember what David said when he reflect on leadership? He said, it's like a sun shining on the morning of a beautiful day. It impacts everybody, it gives everybody vision to see things clearly. And here's what he says. So we've got this other guy, uh, Josheb, Bashabeth, and we've got this next in verse nine. And next to him, along the three mighty, were Eleazar, the son of Dodo, son of Ahoi. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel withdrew. He rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clung to the sword, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. And next to him was Shama, the son of Agi, the Hararite. The Philistines gathered together at Lahi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the men fled from the Philistines. Now, how did he get his name in a book from defending a field of lentils? Because this land was God's land. This was God's property that he had given to God's people. And in this guy's mind, it didn't matter if it was the palace or a field full of lentils, it was worth defending. Dads, that's an important lesson. Because it's easy for us to think this is a battle worth fighting and I can ignore that. Verse 12, but he took his stand in the midst of the plot, he defended it, struck down the Philistines, and the Lord worked a great victory. And three of the 30 chief men went down and came about harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam. So this is back when David was running from Saul, when this happened. A band of Philistines was encamped at the Valley of Rephaim. It's the Valley of Giants, we learned about that a couple weeks ago. David was then in the stronghold and the garrisons of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And David said longingly, just kind of haphazardly, man, that someone would give me water to drink from that well in Bethlehem that is by the gate. And these three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and carried and brought it to David. When they brought it, he would not drink it. He poured it out as an offering to the Lord and said, far be it from me, O Lord that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went at the risk of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zariah, the king of the 30, he wielded a spear against 300 men and killed them and won a name besides the three. He was the most renowned of the 30 and became their commander. He did not attain to the three. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was a valiant man of Kabzeel, a doer of great deeds. He struck down the two Ariels of Moab. Nobody knows what Ariels are. I looked that up, nobody knows. 
I'm just going to picture like giants. We'll just put giants in there. He also went down and struck down a lion in a pit on a day when the snow had fallen. Now, I don't know if you've ever fought a lion, but it's tough. It's harder than you would think. <laughs> and you add snow? Come on. He struck down an Egyptian, a handsome man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but Benaiah went down to him with a staff and snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Man, this guy took the other guy's weapon and killed him with his own weapon. These things did Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and won a name beside the three mighty men. And he was renowned among the 30, but he did not attain to the three. And David set him over his bodyguard. And we have a long list of these names. Azael, the brother of Joab, he was one of the 30. Elhanan, the son of Dodo of Bethlehem, Shema of Herod, Elika of Herod, Helez the Paltite, Ira the son of Akish of Tekoa, Abiezar of Anathoth, Mabunai the Hushthite, Zalman the Hoahite, Maharai the Notaf, Haleb the son of Baana the Nathapha, Itai the son of Gibai of Gibeah of the of the people of Benjamin, another Benaiah of Pirathon, Hidai of the brooks of Gaash, Abai Alban, the Arbathite, Azmaveth of Bahurim, Aliba the Shalbanite, the son of Jashin, Jonathan, Shama the Hararite, Ahiam the son of Sharar the Hararite, Eliapheth, Eliaphalet, the son of Ashbai of Maaka, Eliam, the son, of, the son of Ahithophel. You see that one? Eliam, that was Bathsheba's dad. Hezro of Carmel, Pariah, the Arbite, Egal, the son of Nathan of Zobah, Bani, the Gadite, Zelek, the Ammonite, Naharai, the Beeroth, the armor bearer of Joab, the son of Zariah, Ira, the Ithrite, Garib the Ithrite, you ready for that last one? Uriah the Hittite. That's in there for a reason, and it's last for a reason. 37 in all. Now you're probably asking yourself, why did you just do that <laughs> to yourself? <laughs> I contemplated cutting that section out just because it's a long series of names and those sections tend to put us to sleep. But I read it for a reason. Because these, men's, these, these men, their name were recorded for a reason. They were recorded and their achievements were recorded. Their name is here and their achievements are here because it speaks to the kind of culture that David modeled and valued. See, in culture, people will rise to whatever you value and you reward. If you value and you reward backstabbing, then people will backstab. If at the leadership level, you value corruption because you are a corrupt leader, do not be surprised when people below you start stabbing you in the back. You have created this culture because everything flows from the top down. That's a John Maxwell thing. Everything in leadership flows from the top down. Whatever's happening at the top is happening among the people. And so when we look at our country and we complain about what's happening at the top, it's happening everywhere and in some way, it is a reflection both ways. Whatever happens there happens among the people because they set the standard. And then the people start reinforcing those cultural values and start voting for more and more and more of that stuff and that's how you get to where we are. Godless. So the two things that stand out in this section, the reason why I want to read these names is because it shows us what David valued. He valued courage, but he also rewarded courage. How were these men rewarded? Their names were written down. Your name didn't get re recorded for cheating and stealing and running from battle. Your name got recorded for bravery and for courage and for faith. That's how your name got recorded. 
Your name isn't recorded because you switched sides in the middle of the battle and you started serving Satan or started serving yourself. Your name is recorded because you followed the king to the very end. And when I started this, I told you the importance of being able to read scripture through the lens of the Christ event. And I wanted you to read these names, these names that were recorded for courage and valor, who, who were steadfast at the very end, because church, your name is also recorded in a book somewhere. Our king deals in rewards, and the greatest reward of putting your faith in him as the one true king is that your name is also written in a book somewhere. But the uneasy part of that is, so are all of your deeds. Everyone will give an account for everything they have said and done one day. And if your deeds are not covered by the blood of Christ, you are in a very, very tough spot. Because you will not be able to stand before a holy God on your own merits and somehow bring a case before the king of the universe that your good things outweighed your bad things. These are the kind of subtle things that have been creeping in the church over the last hundred years. This idea that fundamentally we're good people. Oh, we're not good people. None of us are good people. You're born into sin. You're rotten from the birth. You need outside salvation. You need the king to cover you with his blood. You need the forgiveness of Jesus. And when you put your faith in him, you are rewarded with your name being recorded in the Lamb's book of life. And you will spend all eternity with the king. Now, This section is unbelievably important, not just because our name is being recorded, but because also this section reminds us of the importance to hold fast and to keep the faith. I couldn't imagine, I can't imagine how difficult it must be to be a teenager in this world. And every generation says, you know, it's harder and harder, but wherever we are today, like this is 2023, this is probably the hardest it's ever been. I can't imagine the onslaught that teenagers this day, they have to face. And I've got teenagers and I watch it and it's not easy to watch. But the world has been shifted in such a way that teenagers, there is no hiding place. Everywhere they look, they're being advertised to. They're being solicited for something. You can't drive down the road, you can't pick up your phone without something, something alerting you that your attention should be shifted over here or over here. I grew up in a time before there were cell phones. I remember when my parents bought me my first beeper. I remember a time where we were driving through just around Tallahassee and, and in order to check in, you had to have a quarter on you to go find a pay phone and you had to remember phone numbers. Some of you are like, I remember before they were phones. <laughs> Back in my day, we were horseback. My point. <laughs> my point is that the onslaught that this world is facing, especially our young people, requires the vigilance and the courage of the older generation to protect these kids because they don't even know what it was like before this thing called the internet showed up. There are some of us in this room that remember what the world was like before everybody had an opinion about everything. You could ask somebody, what do you think about this? And they could say, oh, I didn't know there was a war in Israel. But it, you stop any average person down the street, ask them any question they want, and they've got an opinion about it. And their opinion is right, and yours is wrong. So how do we protect this younger generation? What is the responsibility of those of us whose names are recorded in this book to protect not just the teenagers, but our other fellow believers who are starting to stray off the path and pay attention to garbage that needs to be put in the garbage. 
There is an expectation on us as the church to be more vigilant and more awake and more familiar with the scripture than we have ever been. If there was ever a time where you need to start reading your Bible, it's right now. And if the only time that you're hearing the Bible is when I'm reading it to you, that's a problem. You gotta get your nose in it for yourself. Why? Not just so that you can grow in faith, but so that you can protect those around you. Moms, your kids need you reading the Bible. Dads, your wife needs you to start reading your Bible. And it doesn't count if somebody has read it and is telling you what it says. You've gotta read it for yourself. Why? Because there's this sense of courage that's wrapped in this chapter that we have lost in the church. There is a understanding of leadership that is clear here that our king rewards faithfulness and our king wants us understanding that we're in the middle of a battle. And that if you treat the onslaught of the enemy like child's play or that it doesn't exist, you are gonna keep getting your clock cleaned. And it's gonna affect your wife and it's gonna affect your kids, it's gonna affect your family, it's gonna affect your job. The church has to start acting like warriors. We have to start paying attention to the battle that we're in because our name is written somewhere. And I guarantee you don't want to stand before the king one day and him say, yeah, your name is in here because one day when you were eight years old, you prayed a prayer and I can't remember a single time that you ever called on me ever again. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Lord, Lord, don't call me Lord. You serve a different Lord and you have a different dad. So in all of this reflection on what good leadership does to people, we're then introduced in chapter 24 with a failure of David. And it reminds us that for all of the aspirations we have for going after godly leadership and for wanting to be a godly leader, you gotta watch out because the people are suckers for idolizing and romanticizing good leaders and leaders are suckers for wanting to please the people. Let's get into it. Chapter 24, verse one. It says, again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. He incited David against them saying, go number Israel and Judah. And so the king said to Joab, the commander of the army, who was with him? Go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and number the people that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many are they are. While, while the eyes of the Lord the king still see it, why does my Lord the king delight in this thing? Joab is saying, why do you want me to go count the people? This is the kind of thing we don't really do. We trust that God's got our back and we don't need to know how many soldiers we have and how many fight, we don't need to know the size of our army. We trust the Lord, even Joab knew this. But the king's word prevailed, verse four, against, excuse me, Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to the number, the people of Israel. And they crossed the Jordan and began from Eror and from the city that is in the middle of the valley towards Gad and on to Jazir. And they came to Gilead and to Kadesh in the land of the Hittites and they came to Dan. And from Dan they went around to Sidon and came to the fortress of Tyre and all the cities of the Hivites, the Canaanites. They went to the Negeb of Judah to Beersheba. And when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days, that's how long it took to take the census, Joab said, the sum of the numbering of the people to the king. In Israel, there's 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. That's over a million in his army. Let's pause there. This story starts with a crucial piece and confusing piece of information. We're told at the beginning that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And then we're told that David took a census because God incited him. So the confusion here is, was God angry as a result of David taking the census? Or 
did, was uh, God angry, excuse me, did God, was God angry over Israel and then as a result incited David to take the census or was God angry because David decided to take the census? So did God initiate this thing or is God responding because he's already angry with David? Well, there's an interesting little tidbit. The story is told again in 1 Chronicles 21 and in 1 Chronicles 21, we're told that Satan is the one who enticed David to count the people. Now, there's a lot of debate among the commentators on what this means, but the consensus from what I can gather is that in the same way that God allowed Satan to tempt Job, God allowed Satan to tempt David to kind of reveal what is in his heart. And so what is revealed inside of David's heart is that deep down, David trusts that if he goes to war and he has the numbers, he will win. Not if he goes to war, he has God and he will win. That's the problem. And that's really the issue going on here. The test was, David, will you put your hope in God or will will you put your hope in the size of your army? Now, a lot of places over here, and I won't leave you hanging, so I wanna, let me show you a map on where the path that Joab took in counting all of these people for the census. He started in Jerusalem, went over to Aurora, went north up around the, uh, Gilead to the Sea of Galilee, Dan, Sidon, Old Tyre, Megiddo, Aphek, down to Gaza. Those places, Aphek and Gaza, sound familiar because that's where the Philistines used to live, but David kicked them out back over to Beersheba and back up to Jerusalem. So this is the route that Joab took in order to count. And at the very end, he had over a million men in his army. Let's continue the story. Verse 10. David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, and said, go and say to David, so God says this to Gad, go and say to David, thus said the Lord, three things I offer you, choose one of them and I will do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and said to him, shall three years of famine come to the land? Or... Will you flee three months from your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days of pestilence in your land? Consider and decide what, shall, what answer I shall return to him who sent me. And David said to the prophet, when the prophet brought this news to him, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercy is great but let me not fall into the hand of man. So David's answer is I'm not gonna pick. I'm gonna throw myself at the mercy of the Lord and maybe God will forgive my sin. Well, the Lord chose the last one, the three days of pestilence. The Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until, from the, morning until the appointed time and there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. That's almost a full FSU stadium. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, so the angel of the Lord had destroyed everybody in the whole Israel, 70,000, and then came right up to Jerusalem. And right when he was about to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, it is enough, now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. And David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. So David repented of his sin, but there were still consequences. The consequences were 70,000 dead Israelites. And I think that was God's way of saying, David, if you wanna put your trust in your people, I'm gonna show you how strong your people are compared to me. When you put your hope 
and even good things, sometimes God will let that good thing crumble in front of you to remind you where you should have put your hope in the first place. And the massacre comes right up to the gates of Jerusalem and David repents and in his prayer he cries out, Lord save these sheep, what have they done? See, it's David's poor shepherding that brought the destruction on the sheep but it's David's wisdom and repentance that is gonna bring an end to this massacre. Let's finish it, pick up in verse 18. Gad came that day to David and said to him, go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Now if you read this account in 1 Chronicles, it's a different name, it's Ornan, and the reason why the two names are different is because sometimes people have nicknames, but it's the same guy. So David went up to Gad's, went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded, and when Aruna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming toward him, and Aruna went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Aruna said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. Now why is he here at this place? One, because the prophet told him to buy land and build an altar here. But two, this is where the angel stopped. So there's gonna be a memorial here. Then Aruna said to David, let my Lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen and the burnt offering, the threshing uh, sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. Here's everything you need. You don't have to pay me. I want this thing to stop as much as you do. All this, O king, Aruna said, he gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. And the king said to Aruna, no, I will buy it from you for a price because I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. Remember the situation that he had with the Ark of the Covenant bringing it back and the price he was willing to pay for worship then? So David brought the threshing floor, excuse me, David bought the flesh, the good Lord. David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for that land and the plague was averted from Israel. Now, following David's repentance, he's instructed to purchase land And the land that he purchases is the exact spot that the angel of the Lord stops his destruction. And we find out in 2 Chronicles 3.1 that when Solomon starts building the temple, he builds the temple at the exact same spot as this altar. This is where Solomon's temple was built. This is profoundly impactful. This isn't just a throwaway scene that doesn't mean anything. This is a place of worship where David realized his biggest mistake in not trusting the Lord. He trusted his people and not the Lord. And this whole story reveals to us the pitfalls of aspiring leadership to high. So in all of our aspirations for godly leadership and all the good things that it does do among God's people and how we should all be aspiring to have good pastors in local churches, to be good godly examples as dads and moms, to be the best boss you possibly can be that reflects the glory of Christ. That's the kind of leader we're aspiring to. We want a president who who models the character of our king. That's what we want. We want leaders who are going to do the kind of things that Jesus would do, that models God's kingdom and not this worldly kingdom. But there is a pitfall that you have to be careful for because in all of our hoping, we can very quickly put our hope in the wrong thing. The people have a tendency to hang all of their weight on one leader. And when that leader finally snaps because he was never created to bear the weight of all of our expectations, we then also fall apart. 
And that is some of the sources of a lot of the church hurt that we have in churches today. So many people have put so much hope and faith and aspiration in this one person. The moment they fail, it's like, well, I, I'm giving up. Church is no different than anywhere else. I don't want any part of it. But the text warns us of the opposite too. Not only do the people have a habit of romanticizing or idolizing the leader, the leader, once put in the position, has a bad habit of looking to the people for the answers. Well, now that I'm here, what am I supposed to be doing in this position? Well, the, the, there's a long line of people who can't wait to tell you that what you're supposed to be doing. You ask the average pastor in America, what is your job? And I would be surprised if 80% of it lines up with what scripture tells us our job is. Because the majority of pastors are, are, are their main responsibility now is making sure, it, it's, it's their country club runners. All they do is just make sure the people are happy and, and all the festivities, or did you get a horse ride? Or you make sure, is the merry-go-round still going? Like, is the smoke machine broken? Is, it making, is, it, is everybody happy? Did I say anything that upset you? I do want you to come back next week. What are we doing? And that cultivates the same atmosphere in you because it sets you on edge thinking that what you're supposed to be doing is making everyone happy. Now, what I'm not saying is just go out and be as offensive as you possibly can. If you hang around here long enough, you're like, it seems like what you're doing. That's not my point. I'm not trying to be offensive. What I'm trying to do is give the truth of God's word right alongside the grace of God's word. The two go hand in hand. But we get this idea of speaking truth confused with manners. And we think that, well, I can't say this thing that is true to this person who desperately needs it because I might offend them. Why are we so upset about this? Because the world has told us that if you love someone, you won't offend them. That's what love is. All the while, Christ is teaching us what love is with nails in his hand while he's bleeding, a crown of thorns on his head. He's teaching the world that the greatest love you have is to lay your life down for a friend. That's what love is. To tell them you're not okay, you need forgiveness. So, my reflection, not just on these two chapters, but on the entire two books, is that godly leadership has a way of raising the standard in every position or pasture, I'll say, that a godly leader is serving in. If you take a godly leader and you put him and he keeps his eyes on Christ in the middle of God's people, the entire standard and the high watermark for God's presence is raised among the entire group. And I'm talking about pastors, but I'm not just talking about pastors. I'm talking about average church members who also serve in leadership positions with no title. One of the most fascinating things that I've learned over the past few years is what it's like to pastor people who have been a Christian longer than I've been alive. It is a unbelievable joy. But with it comes some very unique seasons to navigate. And here's one example of that. Having conversations with older men who go through seasons of life and they hit that point where because their physical body can't allow them to do what they used to do, they feel like they don't have a place in God's family anymore. There's a point at which your back just won't work like it used to. You know what I'm talking about? You feel me. And the moment that happens, the thing you have been known for your entire life is suddenly robbed from you because you're told you can't do this anymore. Well then what good am I? That transition, that seasonal transition from raising the high watermark among God's people, moving from I'm valuable because what I can do to I'm valuable because who I am is so important. 
Hear me. There are men and women in here, and I know because of who you are, you're just like, I just want to do something. I don't feel like God's using me unless I do something. And here's my message to you. You don't need to do something because you are something. And the very fact that you love Christ more than anything in this world and you are here in this family raises the high water mark more than you can possibly even imagine. And in all of our conversations about good godly leadership and those weird seasons and, and those people, I had, we, we had a small group this past week and I was sharing some of the men in my life that when I was young, I was in my teenagers, guys who were in their 50s, 60s, 70s who would take me out to lunch and sit me at their table and say, all right, let's go through Ephesians. I'm gonna show you some things. Let's go through the book of James. Let's go through the book of uh, Exodus. Let's make sure you get this timeline right. At the time, I thought it was great, but I didn't understand the importance of what was happening in the moment. And now that I'm here, I'm looking back on that, and I'm seeing the value of men and women, me and you, not just the pastor, all the weight resting on the people who are the staff, but the weight resting across everybody, the value of folks in this room deciding I'm going to treasure Christ above all things and spend some time with people that I wouldn't normally spend time with. I'm not just gonna, in between the services, hang out with these seven people that I know, but I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna try and have a conversation with somebody who's 15. Good luck. (laughs) But if you don't do it, what influence do you think they're gonna draw from? If they're not getting life in the local church, if people don't seem like they even care if they're there, why are we surprised that when they're old enough to drive, they stop coming? And it's not just for young people, it's for everybody. There is an expectation across all of us to all live as God leaders and to raise the watermark, but you have to be careful because as that watermark raises, we have this temptation of starting to shift our expectations and place a little too much over here on this guy's shoulders or this lady's shoulders. And we start thinking inside of ourselves, well, I, 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 I could never understand the Bible the way that Marshall understands the Bible. Look, let me tell you a secret. I didn't get saved until I was like 17 years old. I haven't been to Bible college. I don't know everything. But what I do have is a passion to want to. Look, that's the secret. There is, there is no expectation sitting on, you, you, you've got to hit this mark and this mark and go to this school and pay this salary and, 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 and uh, uh, get your degree over here and, and have these. No, the only expectation is for you to have a desire on the inside of you for you to want to grow. And if you don't know where to start, send me a message. I love telling you good books and I love telling you bad books. Don't read that one. Read this one. This guy, his commentary, don't even bother with it. But this guy over here, that's a jewel. You wanna read that alongside of you reading this book because it's so valuable. But also don't just read somebody else's material. Sit there and get through it by yourself. Ask yourself, have you ever in your entire Christian walk read the entire Bible? Now I don't mean just like, yeah, we've jumped around from book to book. I think I've covered it all. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about raising the high water mark because everybody in here has read it and knows it. Doesn't know everything in it, but is familiar with it. So, here's the summary for today's message. And I think for this entire book. Look to godly examples of leadership around you, but don't idolize them. Make sure that there are examples around you of what it looks like to follow Christ, to have examples. What does it look like to be a good dad? I don't know, I don't have any examples. And no one, I didn't have a good example. I didn't have a good dad. All right, not an excuse. Go find somebody that's a good dad. Just don't pin all of your expectations and wait on that person to achieve this thing for you. You need godly leaders, but don't idolize them. You should aspire to be an example of a godly leader because it raises the standard around you. But above all things, this is what I want to leave you with. Do not miss this one point. In all of our aspiration to follow Christ, to be an example, to raise the high water mark, you can't miss the simple principle of just keep your eyes on Christ. 
Look, after two whole books of this and all of these illustrations and all, like, okay, can you please just summarize it for me? Like, brain doesn't work that easy. Like, I, 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 I'm so confused. Like, can you just give me a sentence? Yeah, here it is. Keep your eyes on Christ. All of this stuff about leadership and where you're going to go and what you're going to do, like all of it can be summed up in one thing. Christ is the fountain. He is the source. He is the model. And if you keep your eyes fixed on him, you will become the kind of leader that raises the standard around you and you will have no problem finding examples of what it looks like to follow him around you because he will do it all. And the added benefit is he will never let you down. You can go ahead and hang everything on him and he will not snap. Amen? All right, let's pray.